Okay, so I think the people are um, going to join um, soon. So I will, uh, I will just start the webinar the, since the time comes. So thank you for joining our webinar, The Innovative Transformation of Global Supply Chain for Women and All, which is a parallel event of the CSW uh, the 16th. Um, and the, uh, this webinar is hosted by Human Rights Now. The way, and um, by the way, I am Akiko Sato and the Deputy Secretary General of the Human Rights Now and that, um, the will serve the today's the MC. So the We Human Rights Now is Tokyo-based international human rights NGO and dealing with um, the international human rights, including uh, the women's rights in Japan and abroad. So today the we want to discuss um, the, uh, to, uh, the how the industry, the corporates and the investors can transform the global supply chain into something that is sustainable and just for the most marginalized, particularly the girls and women. So today we will have the three the presenters the, from diverse uh, industries. Um, so the, we hope that the, we can discuss this issue the, from the various viewpoints. So um, the, for the participants, the, I want to ask you to turn, uh, not record the, our webinar, and the, we will have the question and a Q&A session. So if you have any questions to the panelists, the, please put your questions in into the Q&A box. And also the today's we do not use the, uh, the raise your hand the function. So the please no, the please not that. So uh, with that, uh, I wanna uh, the, the invite the first, the, the speaker, uh, the Ms. Kazuko Ito. The, she is a, uh, the Secretary General of Human Rights Now and the, uh, dealing with the women's rights for long years and the, uh, the lot of experiences that on the ground. So the, she will talk about the, uh, the women's rights on the ground and also the, uh, the overview of the business and, and human rights. So the, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you um, very much, Akiko, for your kind present uh, introduction. So my name is Kazuko Ito. Um, I'd like to uh, provide introductory remark to this session. So, okay. Yes. Yes, so um, let me briefly introduce that organization Human Rights Now. So Human Rights Now is a Tokyo-based international NGO with ECOSOC status. And our mission is to provide and uh, promote and protect human rights uh, worldwide with special focus in Asia. And our activity includes that fact finding and uh, advocacy and capacity buildings. And business and human rights is uh, one of our focus uh, area together with women's rights issue. And so our activity of business and human rights started uh, since 2013 after Rana Plaza accident in Bangladesh. I guess many of you remember that accident, right? And the building called Rana Plaza just collapsed and killed over 1,000 people with another thousands of people injured. The building was occupied with garment factory and lost balance due to extremely heavy uh, machineries. And prior to the accident, worker notified that the dangerous uh, condition and raised a voice, um, but the management ignored and forced them to work in the very, very dangerous condition that caused such tragedy. Yeah, you can show the photo of that, how the building collapsed. Many victims were young female workers. And one year later, we went to Bangladesh and conducted interview with survivors of Rana Plaza. So, you know, as uh, many people are, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is as uh, a photo in front of the hospital. They are still uh, injured and then they need uh, medication. So uh, we met with them uh, in front of the hospital. Yes, uh, based on the interview, we found very poor working condition of the workers in um, uh, Rana Plaza and Bangladesh as a whole, including extremely cheap wages, 
and illegally, illegally excessive working hours, exploitation, and sexual harassment, and use of child labor. And then in this photo, a lady with black veil um, was a child at the time of incident. And the wages were, you know, uh, at $40 per month. And then in terms of the child, $20 per month. Yeah, it was, it is not, it is not, you know, uh, that day or month, but months, $20 per month. And the important things was that their garment factory were not producing the local product, but producing well-known international brand fashion, such as Inditex and Benetton. This is a problem of global economy with supply chain under which buyer companies can enjoy impunity on human rights abuses in the course of the productions. An initial reaction among the brand was that the buyer are not responsible for a supplier's human rights violation, such as the Rana Plaza accident. So some brand rejected to pay any compensation at all uh, to the survivors and victims. However, uh, the women's movement together with social movement started a huge campaign to ensure accountability of multinational corporation exploiting as a cheap labor in the global south. Yes, yeah, people are, you know, consumers, you know, started campaign in front of the Primax, yeah, and other brands shop. And also, uh, you know, in the Bangladesh, there are a lot of demonstration uh, conducted by other uh, women's female workers, female workers. Yes, this kind of uh, campaign was uh, in part successful because the behavior of fashion brands changed. Many brands start talking, taking workers' rights in global supply chain seriously. And victims of Rana Plaza got some reparation from brands. But however, Rana Plaza was not the end of the story. Uh, this is ILO, as uh, uh, statistics from the ILO. ILO found significant number of accidents and worker deaths and injury after the Rana Plaza. Yeah, at least 35 textile uh, factory incidents and, you know, around 500 worker got injured and at least 27 lost their lives. Yeah, that's the reality. And then also, if we look at uh, that entire supply chain, we can find child labor, for instance, in the cotton farm. And also global supply chain provide and contribute exploitation of workers involved and environmental damages across the globe, including uh, that the climate change. I hope that Ms. Hanazawa will talk additional, additionally more. And we, Japan has a lot of problem too. And Japan accepts technical interns from Vietnam, Myanmar, Indonesia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But their condition is notorious, and situation sometimes meet the criteria of the forced labor and modern slavery. Yeah, confiscation of the passport. Yeah, and withhold um, a high amount of deposition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, overtime work until midnight. Yeah. This is happening in the Japanese supply chain. Yes. And how to solve this problem? So we must look at the international law. International norms and standards support the uh, human rights of workers. Yeah, for instance, in 2011, the UN Human Rights Council unanimously adopted UN Guiding Principle of Business and Human Rights, which is uh, the first UN document expressly define the business relationship of the, the human rights. UNGP that the business has a responsibility to respect human rights, not only their own operation, but also entire value chain. So um, this is a you know, principle, yeah, 11 said, business enter enterprise should respect human rights. And principle 13 said, responsibility to respect human rights requires a, avoid causing or contributing to adverse human rights impact through their own activity. B, 
but B, to seek to prevent or mitigate adverse human rights impacts that are directly linked to their operation, even if they are not contributed to those impacts. So that's, uh, you know, um, this principle, uh, you know, define the uh, respect, you know, responsibility of the business to respect human rights should be entire supply chain. Yes. And also, in order to you know achieve this goal, uh, the corporation must do the three things. The one is that they need to establish the policy, human rights policy, and secondly, they need to do the human rights due diligence. So to identify, prevent, and mitigate that account for that negative human rights impact. And thirdly, and they need to do the remediation. They need to provide remediation. Yes. Yes, and human rights due diligence is, you know, like a risk assessment. And then once they uh, identify the risk, they need to address and they need to mitigate. They need to remediate. And also they need to communicate and disclose what they do and evaluate their action is okay or not. Yeah, that's the entire action is called human rights due diligence. Yes. Yes, so however, the UNGP is a soft law and business responsibility is not legally binding obligation. That's the weak point. And after 10 years from adoption, we must say the implementation status of the UNGP is far from satisfactory. So it is necessary to be, uh, develop and strengthen uh, the legal framework regarding uh, the, the business and human rights. And legal development is making progress. Yeah, this is a photo, uh, you know, that, that across the globe, there is, you know, a soft law is transforming to the hard law obligation of the corporation. That remarkable development is happening across the globe. For instance, uh, that in the France and Germany introduced the mandatory human rights due diligence legislation. And EU Commission is proposing directive with regards to the corporate legal obligation of due diligence. So yeah, that's the way to harden the, you know, as a, from the responsibility to accountability. This is a transformation of the legal, you know, as a the discourse of, in terms of business and human rights. Yes. And then, yeah, human rights responsibility through entire supply chain is very broad responsibility for cooperation. You know, it's starting from modern slavery and then their own operations. And then so uh, in terms of output, for instance, there is some technology, weapons, surveillance, and even social media open to hate speech is involved with the business and human rights. So company must take responsibility to entire supply chain. That's very important, but very broad. But uh, so in other words, it reflects the reality that business can influence the status of the world, either in a good way or bad way, in the to today's globalized world. So for instance, the climate change, let's take the case of climate change. Uh, climate change is a human-made disaster caused by the industry, and many people's fundamental human rights will be heavily affected by the climate change. So we need to address. So last year, the Netherlands court ordered uh, Shell, Shell is a big oil company, to reduce CO2 emission by 45% through entire value chain, not only stage one group enterprise, but also stage two supply chain, but also stage three entire value chains. Yeah. So that's very, very risky. But uh, if Shell achieves this goal and other big company follows, yeah, it is quite strong impact to achieve the global goal of CO2 reduction. So it is important to develop business and human rights legal framework. Yes. So I'd like to uh, touch upon the situation after the COVID-19. So in 2020, after breaking, of the COVID-19, the UN Secretary General, yeah, Guterres, made a remark and saying that, yeah, 
This crisis cannot be resolved without eliminating global inequality, discrimination, and poverty. This is a struggle, not for not only the pandemic, but struggle for equality and human rights. I totally agree with this opinion. Why? So um, you can see this photo. Yeah. This photo is a house of government worker I interviewed in Bangladesh. So I was so shocked. Very small space was filled by as many people. It was impossible to maintain social distance and access to clean water, to wash hands. So you can imagine it is not ideal condition to prevent pandemic at all. Yes, and global economy which leave poor people, use poor people and exploit poor people to make profit cannot be sustainable anymore. So we must address human dignity of people in the production and supply chain. However, what is going on? Unfortunately, the situation of female workers are worsening. So according to the NGO report, that in the garment sector, that due to the COVID, orders are stopped and factory closed and workers participation participating in the union are discriminatorily are dismissed and some worker accepted poor working condition in order to maintain their job and life. So also, uh, this is brand and corporation. Corporation are not really taking serious responsibility. But look at the states. What's going on? Yeah, yeah. We witnessed the state's behavior after COVID. Authoritarian regime around the world started blatant violation of rule of law and commit serious human rights violation and business are involved in this process including Myanmar military operation after coup and detention and forced labor in Uyghur etc etc and we now have the issue of Russia and Ukraine I want to emphasize that business is not innocent bystander anymore if you are operating business as usual yeah, uh, in, in the process of grave human rights violations. So you are contributing or facilitating a continuation of grave human rights abuses. I think the corporate must respect human rights in accordance with the UNCP. That is quite important in this crucial moment. So, uh, so in order to make business take responsibility of human rights seriously, so women's role um, is very important. We must, you know, strength our movement and solidarity. So it is very important. So I made a list what we want to do and what to do. Yes, yes, this is a list of myself in order to achieve the build back better. This is not easy time. This is very difficult time. But, you know, without strength, women's movement and solidarity, we cannot conquer this situation. So let's work together. That's my message. And this, you know, my point would be, you know, discussed later in this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kongiko, for introducing the fundamental idea of business and human rights, as well as serious impacts for the, hum uh, the women's workers on the ground during the, the COVID-19. So I want to invite um, next speaker, the Kika-san. Uh, there she is a founder of the Fashion Girls for Humanity, an award-winning nonprofit organization, a CEO of VPL, a sustainable fashion brand, and the founder of Yabi. A DIY digital fashion marketplace. They're amazing. So she is internationally recognized as an experienced leader in social impact business and initiatives, the women's and entrepreneurship, impact investing, sustainability, the cultivating creative, uh, the public private collaborative, the partnerships, and fundraising for social good. So I 
think that she will um, that talk about her business model and how you know there, uh, she is working on um, the women's rights. So the floor is yours, Kika Sam. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Kika Hanazawa. I'm, I'm a founder of Fashion Girls for Humanity and also a founder of Yabi, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, I'd like to start off with Fashion Girls because this kind of gave us an idea to start uh, Yabi. Fashion Girls for Humanity was founded in 2011 and we've raised over $1.5 million since, um, since then. Um, including pandemic response, which started in March, 2020 for one year. And I'd like to give you a sh uh, show you a short video here, what we've done so far. I feel like a sheep going to slaughter. These are the battle cries of doctors and nurses on the front lines fighting coronavirus without the proper armor. We don't have enough. We can't do our jobs effectively if we aren't safe. So fashion really had nothing to do with PPE gowns in terms of production and materials. But when demand outpaces supply in healthcare, people can die. I wanted to help. So I got a medical gown from a UCLA doctor and reverse engineered the pattern. The gown itself was very simple, but most people had no idea how it was made. I posted my pattern on a YouTube tutorial called how to make a level two isolation gown. So let's start with a front. I thought maybe 100 people might see the video. We had about 10,000 visitors to our site just in one week. We ended up solving the pandemic's medical gown crisis with DIY makers creating 30 million gowns. During the pandemic, um, we've helped um, many people around the world to uh, make medical gowns to protect their community. And we, we've um, uploaded more than 10 designs to our website, translating to multiple languages. We provided materials, um, sometimes sent in paper patterns to those who are in need. Um, this kind of gave us a, a, an idea as to where we, where we are heading in terms of application to fashion, everyday fashion. Um, and that's how Yabi was born. But I'd like to first um, kind of go back and uh, uh, address, sorry, uh, uh, go back and address what, it, what is exactly fashion problems. And the fashion problems uh, are, um, um, just as Kazuko said, you know, it's, um, it represents much bigger supply chain, co global complex uh, supply chain, but it, it, it is so complicated that it, you know, it kind of really represents what it is that we're dealing with, just like a PPE gowns that we, a lot of people didn't have access. When it's centralized, you know, we, we have a problem when there's a, uh, when there's a, uh, supply chain issue. We we don't have access immediately. There's no way to balance the su supply and demand, um, and um, um, every everybody in the community felt that we have to take it back to the local community to address those uh, global supply chain problem. So um, I like to show you again a, a short video um, and then I go into deeper, um, dive deeper into what exactly each problems are in fashion and what Yabi does.
or this was used for the teaser for um, the for the movie premiere last week. So it was a little little suspense music, but um, um, you know, probably wake me up in the West Coast time. Um, I'm going to go deeper into each problem um, from number perspective, so that people will get grasp the idea of why this problem happens. Um, the first problem, the carbon footprint. Average apparel product travels 1.5 times globe. And, and just give you a, uh, a more um, holistic view of what, what this travel looks like. Um, let's say cotton lycra that may be made in the United States um, will go to, cotton will go to Indonesia and then finish in Bangladesh. The, that material, uh, finished material, will then ship to factory. That could be in Asia or Europe, um, assembled, and then uh, packed and shipped to the brand warehouse. Um, in my case, it's United States. Then we'll ship to retailers' web, where, warehouse. Uh, retailers then ship to stores. Um, one example. One product, um, this doesn't even include some of the smaller items like uh, tags, brand tags, um, thread, um, just zipper, fabric, elastic. Zipper comes from Germany, USA cotton, um, Japanese elastic. All of that adds up to um, then stores in Santa Monica, London, Dubai, Japan adds up to 32,000 to 37,000 miles or 60,000 kilometers. And we're not an exception. We're, we're just one of many brands that does business like this for years um, without questioning if this really ever makes sense for something that's sold, I don't know, $100, $200 uh, at retail. Number two, disconnected supply and demand. Um, Long lead time um, and customer short attention, attention span is leading to a significant fashion waste. As you could see, um, every day we hear in the news, all of um, fashion waste from the West is dumped into landfill in Latin America or um, Africa. Uh, why is this? It takes for a typical brand or company to design um, from design to a delivery to store takes about 12 months. And if it's a bigger brand, it takes way more than 12 months. It's probably like more like 18 months um, to start planning, um, design, develop patterns, make samples, sometimes once, twice, three times before um, you stores place order. Then you order materials um, that takes about two, three months uh, for the materials to arrive in the factory, then you assemble. Takes about two months, and then uh, you ship by air or, or by sea. And these days, probably by by air, often uh, when the uh, the container is not available on the ocean freight. Then it goes to store. Number three, um, a lot of profits are basically lost in transit and. Who gets squeezed? Workers. Fair wage problem. For every hundred dollar you pay, makers are only making two to six dollars. Um, just to um, give you um, the breakdown of something that costs hundred dollars in retail, wholesale wholesaler will sell to retailers at forty three dollars. Um, what we call markup. Um, the retail takes 2.2 or 57% or even more. Wholesaler's cost is about $20, of which um, outside of material and shipping, factory gets $10. Of course, factory has to make money. So the actually actual labor cost that is paid to workers are about six, five, six dollars. Um, to just prove this point, this is a, a, a story that I found uh, last year in August um, in CBS News. This is LA. Um, they described LA sweatshop is a modern slavery, wage theft, um, because the brand pays very little for each garment. Um, even though in California, we have a minimum wage, $15, 
the worker actually has to make 300 pieces per hour to make that, make that minimum wage, and which is impossible. So the new law that was enacted, um, we, New York, you don't have this yet, uh, the Government Worker Protection Act. Um, finally, not only the factories are responsible, but the brands and designers are accountable for wage theft. And it will penalize not only the factories, but the brands uh, for wage theft and illegal pay practice. Um, that's called piece, uh, piecework. So Yabi is uh, something that we came up as an idea during the pandemic. Um, if so many people around the world can download designs um, and they can start making, we can decentralize production. And that will address some of the major issues, the fashion, ma fashion major issues such, such as sustainability and fair wage problem, um, especially if we can provide a marketplace for those who can make garments and sell directly to consumers. And by the way, Yabi um, is, is the word that came from Yabe, super cool, I um, mean super cool in Japanese. Um, we wanted to make it something that's easy for people to say it and hopefully it will stick. Um, this is an example. This is not a, a Yabi example, but decentralized fashion example in 2020. Um, J.W. Anderson is a very um, a established luxury designer based in London. Um, Harry Styles on the left, he's a singer wearing the sweater. A woman in California started knitting based on that, um, based on that design. J.W. Anderson then uh, posted uh, downloadable patterns on the website and lots of people around the world started making it and they started selling. So there are people out there who are ready to take this movement to deconstruct the global supply chain. Um, Yabi is going to be the world's first um, digital fashion library. We'll give, we've been providing free online access to downloadable designs and patterns um, sewing Academy that, that includes tutorials, video tutorials um, to be offered in multiple languages. Um, from pop culture, street fashion, um, significant, um, historically significant designs, many of them will be digitized and graded with instructions and tutorials. Um, downloadable designs include patterns, tech pack, um, and in contemporary designs, royalty will be paid to designers. We, we have optional pre-printed uh, pattern kits, um, the material kits that are available. Um, Jerrine Stitches, um, uh, she is uh, based in Tel Aviv, Israel, um, started making Yabi designs and she turned it around within a few days. This will, as I said, this will um, shorten the lead time um, and the decentralized production is a key concept here. Um, the designs are stored in cloud, but by downloading it, it's anywhere in the world you can start making. It will be, the timeline will be reduced um, to just simply production. We can potentially beat even fast fashion in terms of speed and the total mileage of, of product uh, tra uh, traveled will be hopefully reduced to 50% or more um, or if you localize. The growing interest in DIY fashion, you know, over 6 billion views on DIY fashion, um, we believe that this is possible. Not only the people who have a skill, but also younger people learning how to make DIY fashion. So these are the, all the people who are posting their creations on TikTok. And Marketplace allows direct shipping, no warehousing, no excess production or inventory, um, no overhead in terms of space, factory, office. And hopefully the Marketplace we are planning to launch in the next coming months will allow people to sell creations.
um, all sales except for platform fees and shipping will go to creators and makers. They can make um, 10 to 30 times more than what they would otherwise make in a current fashion system. Social mission is something that we're very passionate about and we want to uh, we want to add at the, this end, end of my presentation. Um, we have partnered with nonprofit organizations, women um, in disadvantaged communities in, in, in um, New York. Uh, there will be a sign of work in a few popular styles using the fabric donated by brands and designers. This is an uh, example of Myanmar. Um, Yoko side of the panel. Uh, um, it can show what she's wearing, but um, the impact of, of this dress is made by women, women in Myanmar um, is quite significant. Uh, if he's a fa family of four for two weeks, uh, just with just one dress. We're planning to expand the collection and the program in pipelines include um, help, helping Afghan refugees, Africa, Japan, um, now we are also planning to help Ukrainian refugees. Thank you so much for uh, joining today. And this is it for on my end in terms of presentation. I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you, Kika Sandra, for sharing your experiences and what you have done with the, the quiet innovative idea. I think that your presentation precisely unpacked the, the, some of the issues of the fashion industry. So um, the, before the moving on to the, um, the next speaker, let's, um, the, just excuse me to um, the raise uh, the safety issue because then now the, some of the, um, the, the speakers, including Kazuko and myself and our the administrative staff that will join, uh, are joining this webinar from Japan. And actually, uh, now that we have a bit um, the strong earthquake, so I, I hope that they, um, they will um, not, that won't happen again. But in case, I think that since the, um, it is quite the strong Earthquake. So, um, just in case, perhaps that we uh, the well the the end this webinar if you know there's something that happens. So the the please the, um the, uh, allow us to the make it. Okay, sorry, there I'm a bit you know the nervous because oh wow, yeah this is a very strong earthquake. So I, I hope the katsuko san and the 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 one of said are you fine? And also there's some uh, if you know the audience the um you some of you are joining there from Japan. Yeah, I, I hope that you all safe and please just stay safe. Thank you. Okay, so then last not least, I want to invite um it's the speaker the Lowland. So the Lowen um, is a managing director and head of stewardship and engagement at Boston, the common asset management, a majority employee owned and women led investment management firm specializing in US and international responsible investing. So she has a lot of experiences in this topic, um, including the, in the, some field experiences in Asia. So she will share the, her views on this topic as an investor, and I, I believe that her perspective will uh, give us the, uh, the different the, um, the, the point of view. So the floor is yours, Lelowen. Great, thank you so much, akika san and, and absolutely, I hope everyone in Japan is is okay. Um, what, <laughs> what an interesting time to, to be on a webinar. Um, I wanted to start off by saying that I think um, there is definitely um, a role for investors to play in changing the ecosystem. And, um, you know, I personally have been involved in, in, in this industry for 30 years, and I think very early on in my career, um, sought out um, unique voices, gender experts, human rights experts, those organizations that were actually um, representing impacted workers, impacted communities. And I actually think um, that this is very and a very important point for investors. Um, they need to understand actually what are the risks, what are the opportunities. And in order to do that, they need to um, inform their uh, perspective and decision-making around investment with directly those impacted workers or those that represent them. Um, I wanted to give a, a couple of examples of, of where I've done this. 
Um, <clears throat> in, in particular, I wanted to draw on the apparel sector um, examples that that um, the previous speakers have, have spoken about. And that is, um, for example, as an investor, it is very difficult for us to understand the details behind an apparel supply chain or responsible sourcing of cotton. And so I've um, been working um, on um, learning about these supply chains for many years and in fact, um, you know, supported work and action by companies around boycotting, for example, sourcing of cotton from Uzbekistan, um, given the fact that there was state-sponsored forced labor and children in the fields year after year, um, and actually work collaboratively with companies um, and other stakeholder groups on, on, on required interventions. Um, in particular, though, I think the, the um, the research and the fact finding that I've done in the case of Rana Plaza was probably the most impactful. So after Rana Plaza, very quickly after Rana Plaza, a group of investors, including our firm, came together to um, write um, a call to action to companies and others on what needed to be done um, after Rana Plaza. And some of those were focusing on long-term investment in more sustainable supply chains, but some of them were more addressing the more urgent needs like uh, worker compensation and uh, access to um, medical care, for example. And uh, so actually for, for the last, since 2013, I've been following the progress or the lack thereof um, as, as, um, as part of the formalized um, interventions or solutions that have been um, implemented in Bangladesh in Dhaka. For example, one of the things that I did was actually go to um, DACA in 2014, one year after Rana Plaza, to speak to different kinds of stakeholders. We we toured the factories. Uh, we spoke with um, brands that had uh, staff down, uh, you know, in DACA, um, who worked with factories. But I think the most impactful um, and most informative uh, discussions were actually those with foundations working directly with women garment workers, um, looking at their needs, um, uh, doing training um, on, on how to stand up for their worker rights, participate in worker committees, um, and then, and then we, we did um, also meet with on the ground staff of the Accord and the Alliance. Those were the formalized, uh, legally binding commitments that brands and factories made to improve conditions. And we also spoke with labor unions. And I think um, for me, what, what I realized was that I had to sort of reassess my assumptions of what was needed and what was a solution and what was not. And I think, you know, there were obvious solutions to investing in the factories, providing women garment workers with childcare and subsidized food, you know, and nutrition. But other things that I didn't really think about um, and, and came out of that fact finding trip um, were, were, for example, the need um, to have access to feminine care products. Um, at an affordable price because women garment workers were losing days out of each month, um, not being, at, uh, being able to be on the factory floor. Looking at issues like who were their supervisors on the factory floor um, that created kind of a, an, an, a, an ongoing hostile environment. And what we realized is that many of the supervisors on the factory floor were male Sri Lankan, um, so different culture plus male, and the majority of the of the, the workers on the factory were women, and so that created a hostile environment. I think I'll stop um, here in terms of just giving you a sense of the background and how, um, how some of these conversations have informed our own perspective. So, what role do, do investors have in changing this ecosystem? I think there's many tools in the toolkit. Um, you know, we look at, for example, what criteria we use to screen companies in or out of our portfolios, what data and KPI metrics um, do we use to inform those decisions, um, who, how we're engaging and on what issues um, I think are really important. How do we approach companies on, on, on these issues? I think it's also important that we escalate 
um, action, um, for example, and, and take public stands on when we see something wrong. Um, and for example, in the case of some workplace practices, you know, we consistently vote against boards um, on either gender uh, because of lack of gender or racial um, uh, diversity. Um, you know, we want to ask companies, for example, um, are they conducting uh, racial or gender um, equity audits, um, pay audits? Um, are they looking at new tools like civil society impact off, uh, um, um, audits? But I think the, the most um, tangible um, link to, to also some of the previous speakers is that in our own knowledge building and assessment around these issues, we need to integrate um, gender experts, human rights experts, and impacted stakeholders to actually inform the kinds of questions we're asking for, the kinds of data we're looking at, and the kinds of solutions we're proposing to companies. You know, as we, um, as we, as we, uh, um, as we engage um, for impact. Um, and uh, maybe to bring that home, I wanted to highlight something that we're working on actually right now. Um, you know, we've done a lot on human rights, on, on alignment with the UN guiding principles, um, engaging corp companies on their human rights due diligence process, human rights impact assessments. But what we realized, both in the guidance itself and the way in which companies are implementing it, is that gender or women's issues are not explicitly spelled out. And so, um, we, I'm, I'm currently working with a gender expert um, who's worked on uh, gender specific issues for many, many years. And we're looking at how we can actually develop investor guidance and looking at um, gender, um, looking at a full value chain approach to addressing gender um, uh, and specifically women. And, and what does that mean in terms of a full value chain approach? Very similar to one of the other speakers who talked about taking a full value chain approach. This is looking at a company's own operation, own workplace, their, their product development, their marketing, their distribution, um, their procurement practices, and looking at how um, these, these fundamental kind of business model issues, um, where there's red flags, um, where they might be in um, creating negative um, impacts, but also where there are solutions, um, as, 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 as some of the speakers have spoken about. Um, I think what I will do in the interest of time um, is maybe keep some of the, the challenges and what we need to do um, for the Q&A, um, I, because I want to be respectful of what's happening um, right now um, in Japan. Um, but I'm happy. But I think one 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 call to action I will I will give um, as part of the solution is that the kinds of solutions, the kinds of assessment, the kinds of um, uh, you know mechanisms um, we're asking companies to adopt need to be informed. Um, by those on the ground and those experts. And as investors, I think we need to take collective action to work together, to ask for the right information, to ask for the right solutions. Um, and that can also be done in collaboration directly with companies, other stakeholders and civil society. Thank you. Yeah, thank you Rita, for your informative presentations. Um, the which is the giving us a concrete views on the ground with voices of the workers as well as as the how that you um, you are trying to you know they're making a significant impact on the ground just as a uh, the investor. So I think the um, the role of investors is quite crucial in the sense that the investors they have their own way and also the power to change the ecosystem in the financial the the sectors and also they um, can give the, some the tangible the solutions as you described. And so, yeah, I, I look forward to diving uh, into the, the more uh, this, this topic. Okay, so um, next we will have the panel discussion. So I want to ask the Kika-san and the Kazuko-san to turn on your video. And also the, for the audience, the, if you have any the questions to uh, any the presenters, please the, put your the questions into the Q&A box and I will take the, not maybe all, but yeah, there, there's some of them that um, uh, the, 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 the time allows. Kasuko-san, are you okay or your cat is okay? 
<laughs> there's okay. some technical problem and so I'm 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 yeah I'm joining so all right okay yeah. so I'm yeah. asking the host to um to allow the Kazuko san to turn on her video so yeah the while I'm waiting there there for the Kazuko san to turn on there um yeah I want to just start the panel discussion so I think there each of you have the described the, um, some of the dimensions of the you know the issues uh, on this field and the business and human rights and particularly the, from the women's the rights perspective. So um, to dive into this um, the topic, I think there I, I want to start with the quite the fundamental the question. So what are the obstacles that we need to recognize to realize women's rights? So I think that all of you have touched upon the, some of them uh, in your presentation, but you know, the, to improve the situation, uh, it is essential to have a clear idea of the situation at first. And I think that we do, the, this, you know, the, the, uh, the, the recognize the gap and the recognizing the gap is sometimes the missed uh, in the business and human rights field. So I want to um, ask each of you uh, to give your idea on the obstacles that we need to address in you know, achieving the women's rights in ter uh, the from business and human rights point of view. So I want to uh, ask this question to uh, the Lauren, to you first, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think um, one of the obstacles for investors is, is actually, um, it is very difficult um, to, have um, a, a true understanding of um, what is impacting, what are the real risks and the real solutions in supply chains. And there's not enough, um, so I think there's two things, two key obstacles. One is that um, in many times, um, even companies disclosure, they might have a great human rights impact assessment or human rights um, due diligence process. And they might even highlight um, one of the biggest salient issues are harassment and, and discrimination, but it's so general, their disclosure, and they're saying this is a problem, but they're not also suggesting a solution. So that would be one. So I think this idea that a lot of women-specific risks are are deep in the supply chain, they're embedded, they're, they're, they're focused on in the more general concept of human rights. And frankly, um, we're not seeing sort of a gender responsive or gender um, specific focus. The other one I think though is equally important um, and, and that is, um, you know, we don't, um, we, we don't have the right metrics and the right data. Um, and, and I think um, this is a big issue for us. So not, and some of it is, is the companies are not disclosing. Some of them have not been developed, right? You know, I'm tired of looking at the number of women that were trained, you know, um, in, you know, on, on a certain issue. That's not giving us real, real data or business business model kind of information um, that we can link out a solution to. So I'll stop there because I could say much, much more about this. Yeah, thank you for the giving your idea. I totally agree with uh, two of them. So like, the, the extent of the disclosure is there also quite limited among Japanese the companies as well. So as you just described, the harassment is recognized as a, one of the, the human rights issues to be dis, uh, to be addressed. But yeah, it is also the same for Japanese companies, for instance, that not to you know they uh, give any like a solutions or the, any kind of like uh, the ways the how how they you know they want to address the such issue. So I think they're um, too general the, in terms of disclosure is one of the issues. And uh, yeah, and also the uh, the without the concrete data, yeah, that is uh, also the serious issue, I think. So I and actually, you know, the uh, why there is no the concrete data is because they do not have the clear idea uh, what they should, you know, to find out. So uh, this is the uh, also the because of the lacking the you know the clear idea of the human rights with the, what is the uh, you know the women's rights that the, they need to, to find out. So. Yeah, I think the 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 these yeah they they should be um addressed and also there yeah they can you know they uh give the more the clear way to you know improve the situation. So yeah, the uh the for the same question, the, I want to ask your idea, the Kazuko san. Yes, um, I totally agree with uh, Roland, but uh, so I'd like to add something, but one thing is participation. 
So, you know, women lack participation to the decision making process, or even is that, you know, multi stakeholder process, you know, that, you know, you know, that, you know, if company, you know, take human rights due diligence, they say, you know, they're going to introduce, you know, multi, 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 uh, you know, multi stakeholder approach. And then so, so even if they joined multi stakeholder approach, women are not in the part. And some, there's some tiny percent of the women can be represented. But, um, you know, they can't represent the entire reality. So participation is, you know, uh, important things. You know, uh, we are excluded from, you know, uh, that from, we, can't, we cannot raise information and then we cannot, you know, uh, crucial information cannot be, you know, uh, reached out uh, to the decision-making process. And also that, you know, that the, our idea is not accepted. Uh, you know, without participation. That participation is very, very important. And also, you know, women's voice are uh, often either, you know, suppressed or underestimated. Yeah. So uh, especially a uh, country like Japan, women's voice, uh, you know, get a lot of self-harassment and yeah, and also uh, the, we can we, we have a Me Too movement, but and then so uh, the sexual harassment claim is going on uh, in the working place. But uh, you know that kind of you know claims uh, you know got uh, some retaliation and bashing and backlash. So you know a lot of fear is going on. So I feel like uh, this kind of situation uh, in Japan, as well as the working place in Asian countries. That's my input. Yeah, thank you for your ideas. Um, the lack of the participation. Uh, yeah, I think that, that is a, the, one of the largest issue um, yeah, in entire the industry, I guess. And also the, that reminds me of the low winds, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the sharing on, you know, the, who is the supervising. I mean, you know, the, even that we have the some females the, as participants, you know, there's a participatory approach, but if that space is not, you know, the, the safe the, for these the women, we cannot the, say that this is a meaningful engagement or meaningful participation. So, you know, the, of course, a number of the, uh, the females the, who will participate is the matter, but the, the more serious issue is the how to create the space the, where the females can raise their voices without any fear. So I think the, the still the number is too much focused so that we, we should make sure, you know, that, that the space is really to make the, the females the safer. So, yeah. Uh, but of course, you have to create such the spaces that uh, quite difficult. And then we need the more, like, uh, um, the, the, the more, the perhaps a practice. So the, I want to go next, uh, you, the Kika-san, as an entrepreneur, the, how you feel about the obstacles and also the, perhaps you have the, some ideas the, and the praise to give us. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's such a big topic. So I, I'm, I'm going to focus on maybe the fashion and, and the context of what I, what I discussed. But um, one of the issues... Um, is that women participate in the workforce not for not necessarily just for money, but also the participation in the community, the belonging to the group of women, other women. It, it's the link, right, between yourself as a mom or uh, uh, you know um, housewives, you know, maybe taking a side job or, or so. The participation in the workforce is slightly different sometimes, you know, it's not for the money, but it maybe it's for the community participation. And that makes it a little difficult because incentive is not necessarily driven um, to make more money. Um, it's not like that. So as a result, many people might take pay cut, you know, even if they're highly educated, they may take, take a pay cut. It's just more about participating as opposed to make money. And, and bring in everybody's down, you know, I, I kind of feel like, okay, you know, if th there is a way for them to make perhaps more uh, money, make living, their voice should be heard, they should make more money. But the way um, women are encouraged to participate um, is not necessarily to make more money, but rather to participate. And how do we bring up their pay, you know, a pay scale for overall women who could be more entrepreneur, who could be more independent. 
I find that it is a huge obstacle because if people accept the low pay for women as opposed to men, it just brings down to everyone. And that's one of the biggest problems with the women, women's uh, low pay issue in Japan and bringing the whole, you know, women's rights as a, as a, you know what I mean? Not just participation pay, but, um, but corporate governors, I mean, every level, their low, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're, they're not highly aware of the, the effect of what, how they're accepting their, their status. It is kind of permeates the entire, the re, permeates with the entire women workforce. And, and, and I think that that challenge to me is not just Japan, but in any community, anywhere in the world, if they think that it is, it is not the, it, they don't view it as a right, right? They view it as a, they take it for granted. So how do we change every common women conscious, you know, more, can they be more conscious about what is equal, what, what they can demand as a rights? Um, um, if not everybody can do this, then, okay, can we nurture women leader in those community to, you know, make it more, you know, make it better for everybody? So I think that's the biggest challenge for me. Yeah. Kiko san, oh. can I can I chime in on here? Um, I sure. think um, the role of investors on on exactly that pay issue is, is is extremely important. And I think sometimes as a, an investor outside of the market, um, I'm able to ask more difficult questions of Japanese management on do you have equal pay for equal work? How are you actually supporting retention and promotion and addressing the unique uh, the unique um, challenges of women workers, especially working mothers, right? So we can ask these questions, you know, you say you have a target, how are you implementing that target? So I think um, this idea of sort of what are the core asks as investors, we can ask not only in Japan, but really globally. Um, that standard set of, you know, equal pay for equal work and, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, I think getting more um, consensus and, and standardization around those aspects. Yeah, thank you, Lolan, for your comment. And actually, I have one question to you, Lolan, because, you know, that if I remember correctly, in the UK, there is a law, you know, that which asks the companies to disclose their, um, the gender pay gap or the, if there is any, gen, you know, the pay uh, gap, the wage gap, the, uh, you know, the, uh, regarding the genders. And I think that this is, again, you know, ready to the matter of disclosure. So if, you know, there, the companies are asked to disclose the, such the gender pay gap, then they recognize that there is an issue. And also the, the women themselves can recognize that they are not you know, treated equally. So, you know, the disclosure is, again, the, really the big the matter for this issue, uh, you know. So then my question is like, you know, the, um, perhaps, you know, that there is no the, uh, the binding, like a major, I mean, the legislation in the US, but, they, how the, the U.S. The companies are reacting to this issue? They are willing to disclose some information, or is there any, you know, a kind of their, um, unwillingness there among the companies? What do you view on that? Yeah, I mean, for a long time, actually, um, U.S. companies have had to disclose um, EEO one, so the workforce demographics um, to a certain extent. But what we realized, even that required disclosure doesn't give us uh, enough information. And so we're asking for more disaggregated data to really get into, you know, um, really truly understanding what the profile are, what the challenges are. And the same thing, um, I think more investors are asking uh, around uh, gender gender and racial um, uh, pay, pay gaps. So doing audits on that. Um, and, and, and there's a new, there's a new tool in, in our toolkit called the civil society kind of impact audit, um, which again, a lot of these, a lot of these tools and, 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 and mechanisms are being used, but um, we need more and more investors to, to, to keep asking for these kinds of things to increase disclosure. And frankly, I think to support mandatory disclosure on many. Okay, thank you so much. Do you have any um, better opinion, the Kanzuko san, on this matter? Yeah, so, um, Japan, yeah, you know, Japan women's movement 
you know, consistently demand the disclosure, mandatory disclosure of the wage gap. Yeah, like 20 years. And then so now uh, Japanese government is considering to, uh, you know, uh, introduce the law to, uh, you know, disclose uh, that the wage gap mandatory. So, yeah. So uh, this is a kind of trend from the investors and also the trend uh, coming from the, the UNGP. Uh, that is great. Uh, so, yeah, I think that the investors pressure uh, work very well. So, mm, and we must uh, collaborate each other. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, th there are some the interested questions that uh, they are raising up the, by the audience. So I want to take uh, the according rate. So the first question is perhaps that it is addressed to uh, you, the Kika san. So, mm -hmm. uh, so you know, the first question is that uh, how do you think that the closing the industry due to localization and digitalization? Did it, sorry, digitalization in developed countries? Uh, that will have an impact. On the eight, raise the barriers to entry. Do you have any idea on these questions? Uh, so, um, okay, just to, just to summarize your question, um, is there any um, uh, problem to for uh, for some of the parts of the world to download information? Is that is that the question? The digital divide. Is that is that it? Um, or, um, yeah, there are most of another reading again the question. So, there, uh, 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 so I think, like, our, um, you know, like a uh, localization in developed country, like in the US, or perhaps mm -hmm. in like a Japan, you know, yeah. like a uh, more and more, uh, there is a kind of demand or like a trend. Uh, of the localization and digitalization, and mm, perhaps the, this question I want to ask you: the how the, this kind of a trend in developed countries that will make an impact for the the workers in developing the countries. You know that such a trend will the close the um, any the you know the possibility that for the those in developing the country. This is my <laughs> yeah the, yeah. The, you know, I actually I, I was pleasantly surprised with you know when we did a medical gown project. Um, you know, as I said, it's I thought only hundred people in the developed country would see it, but the reality was you see the hot spots around the world, small little islands, especially rural areas. Um, they know. FEMA is not coming. They know the government is not going to help them. So they actually, there are community leaders in those places where they use technology as a way to, to defend themselves, the way to, I mean, almost what Ukrainians are doing today, right? They, they use technology to defend themselves to, from disease, from, you know, whatever the natural disaster, or in, this, in today's case, it's war. Um, more so, so then perhaps people in urban areas, because urban areas are people, okay, you if you don't have something, you go to store. That's not how people in the rural areas are. So rural countries, little islands around the world, I didn't realize, but unlike the, uh, the pen, um, SARS, uh, that was almost ten, eight, 10 years ago, even in rural areas, areas in China, back then, I don't think they had internet access. Today, Around the world, I found um, they do have access. Um, and of course, there might be parts of the world they don't have an access, but uh, even some parts of Africa, I got the response pretty quickly from Africa, as a matter of fact. They asked me to translate it into um, the whole measurement into metric system so that they can share. And they don't need to, the people who are, who share the information don't need to translate, you know, from imperative to uh, metric. So um, I do believe that it's not the divide. I thought that I was concerned about um, as, is not, it's not really an issue as much as it used to be. And, you know, I pick Myanmar, uh, one of the, I felt that this would be most, one of the most difficult countries that we can work with. Their electricity is, not stable, internet may not be stable, 
yet they were able to make it. I never met them. I, mean, I never even spoke to them. I didn't, we didn't even do a Zoom workshop that we did with some of the people in the United States. Um, and they still made it, right? They made, they were able to make garments. So the, the fact that they can do it, then there are ways to cut all these intermediary. The community and customer can actually directly be connected. Of course, maybe not every single maker can connect with a, you know, Western uh, customer, but the community leader can actually, you know, bind a group together, sewers, makers together in those regions and, and do the trade. And I think that's the beauty of today's modern world. Yeah, thank you for your, yeah, the quite insightful yeah, idea. Yeah, I, 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 you know, there I can imagine like uh, you know, digitalization can empower the females. You know, they uh, yeah, actually like uh, give some power, the additional power for the work, the females or the any marginalized people. You know, they with they using this such you know technology. Of course, that there are some concerns uh, which you know that like a technology will make there some other you know another issue like you know. There is uh, some like a uh, harassment, online harassment, for instance, against the females. So that is that, that should be addressed as well. But you know the problem is the of course the how to they use the such you know technology and not yeah. like a technology itself. So yeah, I think there's there there is some like uh, you know the positive you know uh, the the impact is yeah. uh, quite. You and know, and I would also say that you know one of the drivers this time. You know, which is even different from four or five years ago, is the YouTube quality got so mm -hmm. much better that you can actually learn, you know, sewing tutorials five years ago was not as good as sewing tutorials that individuals are making today. Thanks to the tech, you know, device, hardware device the improvement, mm -hmm. camera, video, um, now you can really make something that you know was not visible before, but the high quality, high def you know definition video allow people to learn something that was not teachable online before, and uh, such as sewing. And uh, you know, instead of having a computer, they can actually learn from their phone. Um, they don't even need to actually print out. Sometimes they just watch and how to make it. You know. Mm, yeah, that true. That is really amazing, and yeah, that that, that should be applied to you know like uh, other people that who are who who cannot they have the uh, the chance to, for instance, like uh, go to school or like uh, go to you know they they have the some like uh, the 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 you know opportunities that to learn the something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, even perhaps in Japan, so. Mm -hmm. So the, I want to ask the Roland if you have any, if you know any, like uh, you know, the positive, uh, the the you know, the cases, uh, the by the using the technology to you know improve the women's rights. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I have to say I think I, I I know the opposite. Um, you know, there actually okay. is is one benchmark that we look at. Um on gender equality um, and, uh, you know, by the World Benchmarking um, Alliance. So I think actually there's some more uh, resources out there that have different data points and metrics, um, which I encourage other, other um, investors to use. But I wanted to actually say on the digital divide and digital inclusion, a lot of what we're looking at um, is actually on the risk side. So there, there actually this uh, digital human rights is an area I work quite um, extensively on engaging so many different kinds of uh, technology players, both platform providers and, and tele telecommunication, you know, um, you know, the, the mobile uh, operators. And there, you know, we're really looking specifically at um, how, um, what kind of assessment technology companies are using, human rights impact assessment, um, on, um, on uh, impacting, uh, um, impacting freedom of expression, privacy, uh, and, and promotion of stereotypes, ha harassment, and, and, and for example, hate crimes. And um, this is very important, and especially since a lot of information is now being automated, um, a lot of AI and, and algorithms are being used. So this is a big focus for investors because it's a big risk for investors. Um, I think there are unfortunately few and far between um, 
you know, outside of maybe uh, education materials and maybe sort of developing like a, a digital world, right? You know, where, where, you know, making connectivity and education are two great benefits, right, of technology. But there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, risk and harm, um, you know, that un underneath that. Yeah, just thank you for the pointing out the, the that the, some you know the, the points that we should concern we should yeah that we should consider, and actually that there is one question in relation to the technology. So you know the uh, the the labor unions uh, they one of the other the stakeholders that, that is uh, quite important to realize the workers' rights, including women and the women's rights. So the question is that the recent created labor the unions became the weaker the worldwide. And not about the working style and technology, this seems to make it difficult. So, what do you? Uh, how do we? How can we? You know, tackle the, with this issue? Do you have any idea, Lauren? I was hoping maybe someone else would take that on. Okay. Um, um, but but we do. I I will say that. Um, you know, it is, we are seeing a weakening of labor, of, of labor unionization, um, especially in places like the U.S. And this has been a traditionally a critical platform for promoting not only worker rights, but also women's rights. And, and so I think as investors, you know, we need to, to look at um, companies' behavior related to labor unions. Yeah, thank you so much. I think they're uh, the way they're the becoming the the you know the uh, the weak uh, the labor unions they're becoming the weak is the also the the common issue in Japan and also there uh, then you know that it is the quite important to the realize that the role of uh, and also their importance of the the trade unions. So yeah, I want to ask your uh, views on this topic. Uh, the Kazuko-san, perhaps to just the role of the uh, the workers, uh, the labor unions, and also if you have any idea they have to use the technology to, you know, strengthen the role of the unions, then yeah, that is also their appreciated. Yeah, thank you very much. And I uh, was very fascinated by the idea of the Kika-san about the, how to use the technology. That is, you know, that uh, remarkably, it's quite rare, good story. But uh, you know, usually we so we we always see uh, that very negative side. You know, online, you know, online harassment, online hate speech, and sometimes you know uh, that online, you know, uh, that we are working on that online sexual harassment and violence. That's very very uh, difficult uh, situation, and we are tackling. And uh, Human Rights Now is doing an a uh, you know survey and that uh, to that uh, uh, networking and online companies, how to, uh, you know, uh, to implement the UNGP uh, to their operation, but, uh, the, you know, they are not responding very well. So that's the situation. So we must tackle a lot of things. But, uh, you know, the Kiko-san story is very, very good. And so, you know, we have an uh, issue of, you know, like a crazy, crazy global supply chain and then so Kikasan pointed out, you know, if one clothes, you know, can be sold by $100 and workers can be distributed just $6. Mm -hmm. And then more than 90% of the, you know, cost will be exploited by someone, someone, you know, the global supply chain or management. Yeah, and then I uh, talked to uh, Kikasan that management is not also very, very happy about that system. System was established and then nobody can change the system. But, uh, you know, there is a solution that internet and technology can cut entire supply chain. And then, you know, you can connect consumer mm -hmm. and, you know, product, pro, you know, the sub person food product. And then, so they can uh, be a center of the production. They are not exploited. So that can be, uh, you know, um, the good things uh, to use the technology. I really, you know, recommend uh, this, you know, uh, tool will be uh, distributed and used. And it's very, uh, in terms of, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting because when you see the maker, people are kind, kinder, consumers and buyers, when they know the face of 
person making it. They are, they can wait. <laughs> they don't need to get it like tomorrow. You know, most people expect from Amazon, they want it right away. But when they know who is making it, they can wait for a week or a month. Mm -hmm. The communication that used to be direct, technology is actually allowing us now to connect with them directly again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people are kinder, people are willing to pay a little more for that human connection, I found, from mm -hmm. our experience. Yeah, yeah. And also we can cut, uh, you know, CO2 emission, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Global supply chain create a lot of, a lot of, you know, CO2 emission, but we can cut that. So that's very, very good. Uh, yeah, Lola, want to say something about that? Yeah, maybe just to say that I think, unfortunately, some of this global supply chain ecosystem will remain, right? And so I think it's also important that there's education to consumers about the alternatives available. But I do think that we are seeing some companies address the supply chain issues, right? And so as investors, we are asking for, you know, how are they investing in their suppliers? How are they, you know, trying to adjust their practice of just in time and, you know, being like paying, paying a higher amount, investing in, in, in capacity building of their suppliers. And, and, and frankly, then that means at the end of the day, you know, either, you know, they take a little bit less of the profit or, or they sort of push it back out to consumers, which is what they normally do. But I do think um, this idea of more legally binding right, uh, contracts and longer contracts with suppliers, even in a global supply chain, um, you know, can have some benefit, you know, to those garment workers, for example, in Bangladesh or Cambodia or Vietnam, that are actually making the product. And then I'd like to add the things of the union, you know, that the unions are weakened, and so that's a big problem. And uh, but uh, I think that it's related to the, the corporate behavior, you know, corporate, you know, suppress, you know, the workers' union. Uh, you know, I saw, uh, you know, we investigated a lot of situations that, uh, you know, the freedom of association are clashed down uh, by uh, Cambodia, uh, by, you know, the management side in Cambodia, Myanmar, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then so uh, if that, uh, you know, big brand uh, will take, you know, the crucial role to protect, the, you know, uh, the workers' rights and especially uh, the freedom of association, that uh, makes a lot of difference. So uh, that's why I think that, you know, that the freedom of association in a workers' union is a crucial part of the UN guiding principle of resistance to human rights uh, implementation. So I'd like to underscore that. And also that, uh, so we have the women's movement and also NGO activities and, you know, the, and the consumers' activity and investors, you know, move, uh, so, so to call it, investors movement, can, can I say? So if we unite, and then so our goal is the same. You know, if we unite, and then so if we, you know, can uh, prevent the suppression of the, you know, uh, workers' uh, rights movement. So, uh, you know, we can uh, have a better future. So that, uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, you know, this session's idea is intersectionality. And if we uh, unite, and we can make difference. So that I really think so. Yeah, thank you for um, the all of the ideas. Um, um, yeah, they how how yeah they how to transform the supply chain. So I you know they uh, listening to your ideas. The um, the ideas you know there I wanna uh, ask is that you know there. Uh, to transform the supply chain, I think the some of the key elements, uh, like you know, first the changing the purchasing the practice, and also like ensure the living wage. I think that these these you know the two elements are now they are uh, uh, discussed quite often. The the when we discuss business and human rights, because you know the even even though the the company said that they conduct the human rights due diligence and they try to you know they ensure the uh, human rights that through that their contracts if they just you know they uh, the the forward their responsibility to their contractors then you know still that they are the the people the who are marginalized and the who are the vulnerable so i think they're the changing the purchasing practice practice 
uh, of their, you know, the large the companies and also how to ensure the living wage are the key, you know, the, uh, the, the, the key dimensions uh, in realizing the women's rights. But then it means that, you know, that someone, they should, you know, the bird, um, the beard, some cost. And, and then the question is who that can the, the beard that cost. Is that the company or the, is that consumer or the, is that investor? So, yeah, I want to ask this question. So perhaps they're starting with Lowland. I think it's a shared responsibility, but I think absolutely, um, you know, as a, as an investor, I think as an investor with the way in which we invest our dollars, it's a really critical point. You want to invest in companies that are not focused on just short term profits over uh, with, and with exploitation, supported by exploitation, but those that are actually very thoughtful in their business model. And even if they have challenges, they're trying to remediate them. So this idea of a longer term, more sustainable, more inclusive, you know, as as I think, um, uh, you know, one of you one of you presented, you know, a better be a build back better, you know, a better future for all, I think is is really, um, as an investor, we should be we should be um, we should be not only assessing companies on this, but rewarding them or not rewarding them with our investor dollars. And I think that's really important. The other thing as investors, we should be, you know, as part of the shared responsibility is asking all companies to pay a sustainable wage. Yeah, that's true. So then um, as an entrepreneur, the, what's your idea, the Kikasan, to make sure they're, um, you know, their sustainable purchasing practices and also their ensure the living wage. Perhaps your, you know, business model, they can, you know, um, they can overcome the, these issues. But yeah, I, I'm curious about I know, as long as it's private, you know, it's it's much easier to do um, if it's, you know, public company, like I, I would assume, Lauren, uh, you invest in just public companies or, or do you also invest in private equity and venture? It's, it's, it's all public equities. It's um, private, public so, equity, right? Yeah. So public, I mean, I think if you're a public company, it's a little different, um, in terms of, in terms of, um, rules, um, disclosure, all of that. I mean, in current capitalism or a lot, you know, last 30 years, it, it has changed. When I graduated from business school, it was all about maximizing shareholder values, right? I mean, that's, that was the ultimate goal, at least in the American context. I mean, not so much maybe in Japan, actually. They, are, they have a social context and they do give, a, give back to society. I mean, there's not some of a practice, but here it's all about maximizing your equity shareholders values. So, but in last 20 years, they, it did evolve and it definitely, um, yeah, is that only only thing that we need to concern about? What about other stakeholders, other community members, workers, you know, consumers, the buyers of the product? I mean, you have to start thinking a little bit more holistically what what everybody's stakeholder uh, value is. Um, if you're you're destroying environment, if you're exploiting from workers, is that is that a good thing? Because that is really just simply divide, you know, creating more, more, um, uh, in bigger gap in terms of wealth, right? The pe few people get it rich, but then all the rest get screwed. Private practice, I mean, we can do a little bit differently. Um, our, you know, most business that I've, I've personally run, I mean, I've worked for public companies, uh, three public companies, um, before, but, in, you know, in private environment, we can do whatever, you know, do the owners of the company can pretty much divide in a way that we, we, we would like to do. And we're, you know, we are certified B corporation. Um, that's one of the ways in which you, you, you evaluate yourself, your business 360 degrees, <laughs> who are your constituencies, you know, who is your supply, who's your suppliers? Are you treating them well? You know, all of the assessment actually really helped the private, you know, private and public business to really go through and see, not only you're creating values for shareholders, but are you creating values for, for, um, you know, for the people around you? And I think that's a pretty interesting concept that is emerging. Um, more companies embr embracing. I see the food industries um, 
a lot of them are pursuing B Corp certification these days. Not so many fashion, we're one of the few. Um, and um, I, I'm hoping that even, I'm pushing this concept even further and this new Yabi uh, enterprise, we are creating a equity pool for makers as well. So makers, they're not employees, but I actually do wanna have a significant option pool for women in Myanmar, women in Afghanistan. You know, if we ever have an idea, take the com company public, um, I'd like to see them standing in New York Stock Exchange, ringing the bell with me. <laughs> so that's that's my goal if we choose to go that, you know, public route, so. <laughs> Mm, that's so cool. Yeah. Oh, when I, I don't know if going public <laughs> is a good idea. That's really something. Right, it's one of the options. Yeah. I don't know, but uh, you know, that would, may not be well received by investors. So we have to see mm -hmm. if things going to change. I don't know. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. my first, you know, my goal is not really for me or part of the got you know, equity holders be super rich. You know, that's mm -hmm. really. <laughs> it's yeah, more yeah, of a, sure. we're, we're pushing some almost socialist ideals using the capitalism. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that is going to be, for me, nobody has done it. And I'd like to, I'd like to experiment it. Maybe, um, we'll see. I just wanted to highlight Kikasan. Actually, we're a certified B Corp as well. Um, oh, and, you are? Uh, Excellent. So this is absolutely since 2016. And, and yeah. uh, you know, so I think our, our, our whole platform and perspective is around stakeholder, right? Capitalism yeah. and, mm. and looking at the different stakeholders and uh, working with different stakeholders. And I, I think we need to grow that, that, that pool of investors, you know, with that same mentality. I know, I know we need more of you. <laughs> mm. Yeah, the Beep Corp is also introduced in Japan, but I'm not sure that we have any of the companies satisfied by I Beep mean, Japan Corp. is actually very interesting because they do have that more of a, you know, social, it's wealth within the business is divided more equally, you know, they're not mm -hmm. really, somehow, you know, if you try to make, if you want to be super rich, I mean, in a way that's actually, it's discouraged. <laughs> so, I mean, nobody really makes too much money and are kind of wealth are distributed more equally among all people. And <laughs> it's very different from American capitalism. So, I mean, there's a good and bad, right? I mean, they're, they're kind of slow to embrace new idea, have a recruit women into women leadership in the company mm -hmm. or corporate governance is also another big issue in, in Japan. There are not a lot of Japanese, you know, women uh, uh, board members. Um, I mean, it is a challenge also global economy. I mean, there are not a lot of women pool to be, mm -hmm. to be elected to those, you know, uh, governing position, board of directors in, in a corporate level. So, um, I mean, there's, there are pros and cons. Um, yeah, that's true. And after like uh, the idea of the stakeholder capitalism is you know, now, you know, the quite like a popular the, among Japanese the companies and, you know, the more and more the Japanese companies and as well as the government of Japan, you know, uh, they try to um, the make this to happen or to make uh, integrate integrate this idea into like a existing the um, the ideas or like a future the policies. But we are not sure the, what you know it really means to you know the women's rights or the other the human rights. And you know the idea is just there, but you know the the matter is how to you know realize it. So yeah, therefore this. Um, the, the matter I want to ask, uh, the Kazuko san for your view, you know, the how the now the uh, stakeholder capitalism is, is embraced by Japanese companies, and is it useful to realize the women's rights? Yes, I think that, uh, you know, the, the uh, Kiko san is right. Uh, there is, you know, some, you know, good tradition in the Japanese, you know, on capitalism, but until 1980s and after the 1990s, you know, neoliberal. Ne ne 
you know, a globalization idea coming from Western country uh, influenced to Japan and Japan's you know, capitalism was, you know, a bit contaminated by the neoliberal ideas. And so I, you know, and then so now, uh, you know, stakeholder capitalism is, you know, a center of the discussion right now. And I think that the, uh, Akiko-san is also the center of the discussion. And I really appreciate that. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, that uh, we used to have stakeholder capitalism, but male dominated. And then now we try to back the stakeholder uh, capitalism, and but a genuine one, genuine one, you know, not excluding women, minority, etc. Yeah, that's quite important things. And also I'd like to address the issue of the, the living wages. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I am supporting for that, um, yeah, mandatory human rights due diligence, you know, uh, for instance, that the EU due diligence and also that the now treaty, legally binding treaty of the business and human rights and a lot of opposition against that. I don't know why I can't, I can't get that. So uh, we must achieve that, you know, universal treaty on the binding business and human rights. That's very important. But uh, human rights is a little bit vague word. The people need the economic empowerment. And, you know, we must to, you know, eliminate, uh, you know, global inequality. That's caused a lot of problems. And then so living wages are key for uh, the decent work, human dignity, and also you know, elimination of the inequality and women's empowerment. So I think that the Kikasan may introduce that uh, that the California practice, California law, uh, to ensure that um, you know living wages, right? And then so brand has a responsibility and obligation to ensure that uh, living wages on entire supply chain that's achieved in California. And then there is some proposal <coughs> to achieve <coughs> the same types of regulation in the EU by the NGOs. Yeah, I think I, after the, you know, EU, di EU uh, directive on human rights due diligence, the next thing should be the EU regulation of the living wages. That's my proposal. And after that, you know, Japan must follow the same direction. I, I was hoping I could chime in <laughs> on one governance, one governance corporate practice, which I actually think speaks to economic livelihoods and you know there's two things that investors actually have been looking at and that is um how companies where are companies paying fair tax so i think this idea even even on corporate tax practices this is a fundamental um you know uh, uh basis or platform for economic livelihoods so are you know are they paying a fair tax where are they paying a fair tax what is their effective tax rate in different markets are they aggressive in in avoiding taxes in certain places because you know as as part of a globe global economy you know when companies are not paying their fair share of tax or even the effective tax rate you know they're not there's not the funds for the government then to redeploy into social into social welfare programs right and so that is a big that is a big core governance practice that as investors were addressing as well as some other groups the other one is looking at alignment of business models so how for example is a company influencing public policy and regulation are they trying to impede the ability, for example, to have a living wage in, 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 a, in a state or in a city, um, or are they actively supporting it? And, 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 and in the same case in, you know, influencing, um, you know, judicial systems and judges. So anyway, looking at both the corporate tax practice and the political influence of a company are really fundamental places for not only investors to look at, but also other um, NGOs and civil society. Yeah, thank you for raising uh, that um, the issue. I think that that is uh, the quite now the missing uh, among Japanese companies. So, you know, therefore any, um, like, a, I, I don't say that that's 
is only a political issue, but you know, like uh, the issues that uh, the which are regarded as political, the for, uh, the for such the kind of issue, Japanese the companies the hardly you know address uh, in in public, and they you know they they said that they try to be neutral, but you know, like uh, being in the neutral, that doesn't mean the support the issue. I mean, the, not like a support the the rights holders or rights the females. And the being neutral the means. The, you know the contributing or they're like a, uh the contributing to you know the making their the issues worsen so i think that you know the speaking up the publicly or the supporting the any issues publicly is the one of the key roles of the the companies and also the how to push the the company's support is uh again the role of the investors and i hope that more and more the companies that will speak up the any like uh, um the fundamental issue uh including human rights and also the try to you know the push the policies that are uh, the forward yeah the, what do you think of the this you know the issue the kazuko san that when you look at the the attitude of the japanese companies for instance oh, sorry sorry okay can you say this again oh uh, yeah the, what do you think of the the current the attitude of the japanese companies um you know their towards uh or in terms of the speaking up like a uh, public issues or like a uh, supporting or the how, how do you know their uh, behave the, the for the such issue in public uh yeah it's really difficult for the japanese company to speak up and they don't want to you know uh make a stance you know for instance you know the, let's take a case of that the U legal issues but you issue of ukraine so they don't want to uh take us any stance at all so but uh that makes uh japanese Companies position very weak and vulnerable, I think. You know, so they don't uh, really uh, you know, take stunts and just swinging and just, you know, and then making any, you know, uh, product at all. And so there is no solution at all. So then, for instance, that, that you know, that someone cannot, uh, how, to, how to deal with the crisis in Ukraine and how to deal with the business in Russia. You know, Japanese government cannot take stance, but uh, you know, it is not a uh, time to do so. Uh, so, right? So, I think that Japanese, uh, especially as I said, that um, uh, currently uh, that the authoritarian regime uh, is uh, taking part of that. You know, that the uh, changing the world map right now. So, um, you know, uh, government. Uh, you know, that the business is not really the bystander. So they need to take stance whether uh, they continue the business uh, with human rights violation or whether uh, they make a stance to you know, promote human rights. That's very, very important moment and crucial moment. I'd like to encourage Japanese government uh, to raise voice. So that's very important. Yeah, yeah thank you for that. You know, regarding the living wage, you know, I know that some of the, the, the companies, including Japanese companies, that commit to, you know, living wage in their, for instance, the human rights policies. But like uh, I, I heard, I, I they found the one article that saying that even if they commit to living wage, but, you know, the, the, the reality is not like that. You know, the, they, you know, the commitment means not just saying about that, but more like the to you know they try their best to realize that. So of course the commitment is a first step, but you know they if they really think it matter, then they should do everything that they want to real they they can do for realizing the such the matter. So I think that the, what the classical risk describe is like uh, uh, the fundamental issues of the Japanese the, the government as well as company. But of course that we can see the some the same kind of issue perhaps among the US the, the companies. So yeah, perhaps the, how to the start the conversation is also like a um you know um, the common issue the um, among the world the when we the uh the discuss the this the business the human rights issue. So I think there uh that we are uh the uh, approaching the, the closing time, but I, I just want to ask the one question about uh, the, the linkage between women's rights and environmental rights, if 
it okay because you know that uh, it's impressive to see it, um you mentioned about the carbon foot footprint uh in your presentation the kikka-san so of course it's not like a um directly linked to the women's rights in your presentation but when you look at the uh the you know the the decision on the ground the, what do you think or the, how do you find that the linkage between environment rights and women's rights particularly you know the workers rights um i think that um and I'm mean, educating consumers and public on, on this distance of each product travel is very important because many people do not seem to make a you know connection between the price you pay and then why the price is so low is you know because it's kind of like a negative correlation right you you pay very low price because it's coming from really far away it's exploited somewhere where the human rights are not reachable and we need to understand that more transparently what how the system is built today in a parallel world because this is just a microcosm of all other products that we see right in our life fashion supply chain to be most complex um and this, you know if you know fashion supply chain you can actually deal with any other supply chain that's what we were told at a business school or the corporation you know like a big trading company i was told like if you can if you know the textile supply chain then you can do it you know military device plane defense i mean you could do everything else um, because it's shorter, it's complex, and, you know, you got to do this thing so fast with just one person. So I think that it's very important for consumer to realize the price has deflated in apparel from the last 30 years. So, but you, what you're doing is you're exploiting someone else's rights somewhere else, you know, as a result. But it's really hard, you know, when we even try this Yabi concept, right? I did a survey of consumers. It's like, okay, you understand all this supply chain and global climate climate issues. Okay, which one do you choose? They don't pick five hundred dollar product or the same product. They pick sixty dollars from Afghanistan. So, you know, it's really hard for me. It's the same product, but you still pick the lowest price, right? I mean, we have to be conscious as to. What really means for consumers to pick that product and, and what is that environmental effect? Um, you may be better off buying, high, pay higher price, but get something locally, made by someone locally. You know, it's, we still have the dilemma. I don't know how to persuade. I think the maker, buyer communication or connection, we establish that as opposed to some mass produced product centralized production somewhere in in some part of the world exploiting the labor you know we we tend to gravitate towards that because we don't know the story of that person right so the more transparent we become and educate consumers keep educating the consequence of buying that you know 12 dollar t-shirts that was priced 12 dollars 80 you know 30 years ago it's not the same story we have to understand what that means to us and maybe buy less, produce less. <laughs> I mean, that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly true. And we human rights now uh, is also trying to, you know, disseminate the such idea that by using like a SNS, you know, that we have some interns that are therefore now the undergraduate and they are, you know, so innovative to create uh, some like, uh, you know, the material that, that is the, um, the user friendly and, you know, realize how the our the daily uses, the daily, you know, the, 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 uh, the stuff is connected to the world. Yeah, it is now that some something are the now becoming visible, but still the is quite invisible. So without you know the uh the yeah being the conscious, we cannot just see such the connection. And there the regard you know the with that, I think the transparency is again you know there another um the the big the the issues or the important you know like uh the concept uh the to you know the uh to improve the situation. So I want to ask the last question to each of you. So the today's, you know, topics is focusing on the more like uh, the women's rights. But, you know, that sometimes the people just say that, okay, this is just the matters for women's. But I don't think so, uh, <laughs> uh, particularly in my opinion. But so my last question is that um, 
like the, what does the promoting the women's rights mean to the whole society? How is it, you know, the meaning for the for all? The how can we then make any the, the impact the for the uh, the the for the whole society by you know the, the tackling the women's rights issues? So I want to uh, just start with the 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 Lauren, maybe. Sure. Um, I actually also had a comment uh, about um, the link between environmental um, uh, issues and, and human rights issues. I think what we see is there's a lot of correlation, actually, of those risks. And I think as investors, um, you know, if we want to, we need to connect the climate crisis to, um, to human rights issues. And the most e egregious human rights issues are also in the places with the worst ecological damage. And so I think, you know, in some ways, and, and, I'll, and, and I'll link it back to your question on how to promote women's rights, I think as a society and as investors, you know, in my role, we need to take a more holistic approach to connecting these issues, right? And that um, potentially is looking at a more sort of um, focus on biodiversity, right? And, and looking at supporting biodiversity efforts, both in terms of um, those, pra you know, avoiding practices that cause the most ecological destruction and damage and promoting those that are actually protecting and creating, you know, um, um, in protecting biodiversity. And I think, in many ways, you can have some other impacts on, say, human rights um, and, and and women's rights. Yeah, thank you for sharing the um, the, the the very important the perspective, like a biodiversity as well. So the way actually the human rights can be integrated into any sustainable, you know, any issues in relation to sustainability. And I think I, I believe that the human rights should be embedded it into any practices in terms of sustainability. So, yeah, I want to ask um, the, your view, the Kika-san, the for the how, how do you think that the promoting the women's rights mean to others, what they mean, mean to the whole society? Um, I think that, you know, I mean, fashion is one of the probably easy uh, e in industry for women to participate in, always the case for, you know, centuries. Um, the industry revolution kind of changed the way we started participating, um, um, you know, from textile to apparel assembly and in the supply chain get more complicated than what actually less they are getting paid. Um, but if you can bring back the old tradition of, you know, somewhat, okay, women's fashion made by women for women, if we can take that back, right? <laughs> I mean, I think that let's give, you know, it is a huge issue to tackle, but as a consumer, all of us as an individual, we, there are actions that we can take. And I, yeah, I mean, we may not address the entire problem of, hey, just textiles are very toxic or, you know, we may not be able to affect that change right away, but there are something, fashion is part of our life, like just like a, you know, house, clothes, food, we all need it. Okay, how do we take action um, to address, you know, climate change, women's rights? How do we support women directly? I mean, if we can all take, if we individual can start taking actions, we can change the world together. Yeah, thank you for your powerful message. So, yeah, there. I want to ask you a last comment, the Kazpo-san. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And so, as uh, that uh, in this world. The half of the population are women, okay? And the women's voice are suppressed. What kind of society are they, you know? I think that, that there's some, uh, in the society, there's some people marginalized and suppressed. That kind of society are not really sound society at all. But uh, the majority, you know, the, you know, the, the women's are half, you know, the 50%, more than 50% of the population. And their opinion are not really appreciated. That society is not really sustainable at all. So we must participate equally. That's one thing, you know, it's very, very important. And also the women's view is very important. Uh, so now uh, today, uh, so there's earthquake. Uh, my cat is, you know, uh, you know, crying because of, uh, you know, he, 
you know, uh, weakness that, you know, the dangerous is coming, danger situation is coming. You know, women uh, know uh, the situation very well on the ground. And then so uh, women can make, you know, early warning of the situation, for instance, that, uh, you know, conflict or environmental damage, climate change, etc. Women can be sensitive and then they have ability to raise a voice and good voice. And then if we ignore that kind of, you know, voice, another disaster will happen, like Rana Plaza accident happened. Yes. Yes. So uh, in order to achieve sustainability, we must, you know, strengthen the women's movement. And I hope that today uh, lots of women come from CSW meeting and we want to unite with a lot of, you know, worldwide uh, women's movement and work together. So situation is very difficult and we must tackle a lot of problems and we must unite. That's very important. Let's change the world. Uh, thank you, uh, Kazuko san for the, uh, the final message. So now there, I want to um, the, we, we, uh, end this the webinar. So I think that today we've explored the various the ideas to improve the situation, including the data collection, disclosure, the role of labor union, or the how to use the technology. So I hope that the, the, that the discussion will um, the, be the starting point for the future collaboration and uh, the, let's the keep moving. So yeah, the, then uh, the, with that, the, I want to end this webinar. So thank you for joining us and have a great day and also have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much for having us. Bye.